Please join us as we talk about aspiration and the pulmonary biome, and my colleague and I, Aaron Padilla and Phyllis Palmer, we will provide you with a nifty framework for dysphagia management. Aspiration and the pulmonary biome, a clinical framework for dysphagia management from Phyllis Palmer and Aaron Padilla. We have nothing to disclose. So the big thing we're going to be talking about today is the concern in dysphagia management. We all know that dysphagia can lead to adverse events that are related to difficulty swallowing. But what we also are going to be talking about today is we know that dysphagia can increase the odds of prandial aspiration, doesn't guarantee it. And although if prandial aspiration is present, it isn't a one-to-one relationship where we have prandial aspiration and then we have a dysphagia-related adverse event. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. So the confusing part then is uh, you have patients who aspirate and you might think, okay, this person's aspirating, so I need to make them NPO. The downside is that when you make someone NPO, they're at risk for a disuse atrophy, so you might actually make the swallow problem worse. And the other variable is that when aspiration occurs, it doesn't guarantee a bad outcome. So how do we differentiate from those patients who aspirate who will be okay and those who aspirate who will not be okay? Often the missing piece in dysphagia management is linking the swallow disorder to what we already know about the individual host and what we know about lungs and how they behave when aspiration occurs. So let's first talk about the lung microbiome. In the host framework with dysphagia management, the lungs are one of the most important parts. So we know many things about the lungs, although we're still learning. We used to think that the lungs were initially sterile. We know that that's not the case now, that there are colonies of bacteria in the lungs, especially in the upper airways. We know in the lower airways around the level of the alveolus where gas exchange occurs, that there's little nutrients, so it's difficult for bacteria to survive. Specifically, there's very little protein and very little iron. As a result of that, um, if we have a patient with dysphagia and there's chronic aspiration, the host is unable to respond to it, the pulmonary biome can become similar to the gut biome. What we don't know is we don't know how long someone can adequately withstand or manage or tolerate aspiration. We do know some patients will do fine for many years, while others can result in a adult onset pulmonary condition, such as adult onset asthma, bronchiectasis, or even a pulmonary fibrosis. So we'll be talking about a little later in the presentation, who can we take that risk with and when can we not? Okay, so now that we've talked about the lung microbiome, let's talk about the immigration and elimination cycle in the lung. So as Aaron pointed out, a healthy lung doesn't really contain many nutrients to support bacteria. To maintain lung homeostasis, we need a balance between immigration, the stuff that gets, that goes into the lung, and elimination, which is the process for getting stuff out of the lung. Immigration occurs in the form of microaspiration and macroaspiration. So microaspiration here, I'm talking about uh, aspiration of saliva, which happens in all even healthy people, uh, particularly when you're sleeping. In macroaspiration, I'm talking about the aspiration of food or liquids associated with meal times, or perhaps even aspirated reflux material. Elimination works to efficiently get rid of immigration. Elimination occurs through various processes. When material is above the vocal folds, we can eliminate material through the propulsive and productive cough. When material enters the lungs, particularly when we reach lower lobes, we engage the mucociliary escalator. Here, mucus in the lungs serves to trap the particles and coughing combined with ciliary action serve to move the particles upward toward the pharynx. Meanwhile, phagocytosis takes place. So here you have leukocytes, or these white blood cells, that engulf and break down the bacteria using an enzymatic process. Also, the lung has an osmotic homeostasis, which is maintained through these ion channels that allow the passage of liquid 
um, excretion and absorption of liquid across the ion channels. These aquaporin ion channels may serve to reduce the impact of liquid aspiration by transferring liquid from the alveolar space to the capillaries. In general, when aspiration occurs in a healthy lung, the goal is to maintain adequate elimination so that you control immigration. Collectively, these elimination efforts work to keep the lungs free from bacteria. A high bacterial burden in the lungs, which occurs when immigration is greater than elimination, influences progression and exacerbation of disease, uh, response to intervention, and even mortality. Things that may negatively impact elimination include um, a patient with an impaired cough reflex, uh, an endobronchial obstruction, impaired ciliary function, the presence of an endotracheal tube, having an impaired immune response, being on certain medications like inhaled steroids and whatnot. Things that support immigration, which we don't necessarily want to support, relationship to the lung opening. So when we're talking about swallowing, where there's a shared conduit of the pharynx, the, we have a nice setup for, to support immigration because food has to run through the pharynx, which is the same pathway used by the airway. When immigration occurs, we have some defenses that we call into. And we just talked about those a little bit in the elimination immigration cycle. But let's talk a little bit more about aspects of elimination. So the first line of defense would be when you have penetration and things are above the vocal folds. You have some laryngeal valving. You have the trajectory of the larynx to move the larynx out of the way of the bolus flow. You have a productive cough that reacts to any penetration. And then you combine all this with good oral care routines so that microaspiration does not result and a microbial burden for, from the oral pharynx to the lung when aspiration does occur. So next we have the reactive defenses, which are the friends that come in for help when the proactive defenses are unsuccessful. In the healthy lung, we have the cough and mucociliary clearance. We know that cough has to be robust enough, about 270 liters per minute is measured by pre peak airflow to clear aspirate. Mucociliary clearance, what happens with this is a small amount of mucus is secreted to the aspirate, the cilia or hair fibers move it up from the lower airways out of the, into the upper airway and then out of the host. Um, we can have acute things that impact mucociliary clearance. One is dehydration or chronic chemical usage such as tobacco smoke. If an individual does see smoking, we should see an improvement in the mucociliary clearance. We also have the immune function, the specialized macrophage white blood cell that takes place in phagocytosis as Dr. Palmer was discussing. And then something that was up for discussion between us is, is inflammation a host response? How much inflammation is good? We know with inflammation, we'll have an increase in blood flow, increase in the specialized cells that help manage the host. But when that inflammation becomes too burdensome and and overcomes the host, then that's when we can have a pulmonary event such as pneumonia. So something maybe to discuss amongst yourselves or in your groups of, you know, is inflammation bad or good? Just a thought provoking question there. In creating this talk, we wanted to create a sort of jingle for all of the folks in the clinic and in the research lab on how do we remember this framework? What's the nugget that I can take with me back to work tomorrow to improve patient outcomes? And we created the bullet. So we're going to be talking about this in more detail, but B is for bolus variables, O is for oral health and oral care, L is for lifestyle and, and level of activity, U is for unintended or iatrogenic risks, S is for system status or overall general health. 